Well, good morning. Blue light special. Only older people are laughed just then. <laughs> so if you laugh, you're old. So good luck for that. Man, it goes back a minute. So Ecclesiastes, it has been, it has been a season, it's been a couple of years since I've wanted to do this. A couple of years. And it is one of these things that is so pertinent, these books in the Bible that is so pertinent to us right now. And I'm, I'm real excited to say, I really want you to make, pay attention because I found out this week why, I think I, at least, I think I found out why I haven't done it yet. It's because I found something out through study that opened it up more than it's ever opened up to me. So you're going to hear that this morning. It's not, like, it's not like new age ethereal stuff that's out there. It is scholarly stuff that we miss if we don't dig deep. Okay, so we take words and we get used to things, but this is something I think will have great value. So Ecclesiastes comes from the Latin translation of the Hebrew term quoheleth in the opening verse. The, this word which refers to someone who assembles a group. We're going to be talking about that in a moment. It is... It appears 38 times uh, the word hevel appears vanity 38 times. Have you heard it before? Vanity, vanity, all things are vanity. Everything is, there's nothing new under the sun. It's all vanity. It comes across very difficult. But we're going to dig deeper to where I think you're going to see that we have hope. I know you're going to see that we have hope, actually. Here is a general outline. Next slide, please that can give you an idea of where we're going. So the theme is emptiness. Uh, and we're going to talk about this, that this week. The next uh, five some chapters are the search for meaning. You ever done that before in your life? Have you ever felt empty and then looking for meaning? And then you're going to get the teacher's advice. And then you're going to have the conclusion, and every week we are going to end with the conclusion as through this, because I don't want to leave you hanging every week. Another way to view this, think of Solomon, we're going to think of his search for God, for joy, then we're going to hear some of his sayings or some of his wisdom. And then we're going to get to a solution. So however you want to look at that, we're going to look at that this morning, and we're going to lead that through the coming weeks. You ready to go with me? That was weak. It's all vanity, right? You're just like, Whoa. All right. So the first two verses here. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, I think I know, I would say that most of us, if you've gotten to some point in your life, you started looking around and saying, what is there? What is there? It's like, we're going to see through it. It's just like, man, sometimes it's just a the treadmill of life gets to you, and it's just like, man, life is vanity. The discouragements of life, it comes in. Even sometimes good things that happen don't bring us joy. Matter of fact, that's when I knew a couple years ago that I was, whether you would call it depressed or burnt out, is that even when I was doing things I loved to do, I found no joy in it. That was so telling to me. I was with family, and family I loved, by the way. It wasn't like, you know, family. Uh, it, was, it was good family. And I had the boat. I was on an island. I was doing all this stuff, and there was zero in my heart. I was just burnt, burnt to a crisp. And in that moment, it felt vanity. All this is vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. And though I was surrounded by family who loved me and friends who loved me, 
I felt alone. I don't know if y'all have been there or not. That's where I was. Now we go through peaks and valleys of that in life. It happens. But when you read these two verses, to me, I think of misery. So to put it in contextual terms, I thought of two people who are dear to my life. I'm getting ready to throw their pictures up. If you don't know these guys, they're my spirit animal. So much of my life was spent looking all around me and going, hey, you know, what's wrong with you? Just, man, that was a little scary. Sorry for those in front of that. Man, at least you got some space with me. That was good. I mean, these guys, all they did was look from a distance and criticize everything around them. I've been that person too. Because sometimes when you're dark inside, I'm not talking about not saved. I'm not talking about apart from Christ. I am talking about walking where I felt alone, even though surrounded. You know, a uh, pessimist, when they go into a group meeting, like we go to Second Sunday, instead of shaking hands with each other, they shake their heads. You fools. What are you doing? Oh, you know, they look at each other and just shake their head at one another. So what it, this is where I'm going to begin. The next slide, please. This is where I'm going to begin to unpack an important word for you. One more slide, bud. There we go. In the Strong's Concordance, and you're going to have to stay with me because I'm going to end towards the end with another Strong's Concordance piece. The word vanity here stands for hebel, and it means a vapor or a breath. Not sure. Let's see. I'm going to see how this goes. Probably not yet. No, I'll let it burn up a little more. You have to remind me when you see it boiling. It, it means a vapor or a breath. Vanity. Other ways this is used in Scripture, in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 13, it says this. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. Next slide. There we go. The wind will carry them all, all off. You hear this? The wind. A breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. We'll read this one more time. When you cry out, let your collection of idols, another way to say it is like other gods, deliver you. The wind will carry them all off. A breath will take them away. But he or she who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. So what you should be able to see here is attention. If your dependence on earthly things, it is but, you can't see it, I can see it, it's but a vapor. It just passes away. You remember the Red Rider BB gun? This is where you know you're old, old. <laughs> I gotta have that Red Rider BB gun. Look at you. <laughs> gotta have it. Maybe you have a Christmas memory where there was just one toy you just had to have. Maybe you didn't get it, I don't know. But maybe, then you get it, and by that evening, the possession of it did not mean as much as the idea. It's just dust in the wind. All the things that we attain, and this is where, again, I can sound like the two guys on the Muppet Show. Vanity! Vanity! From the top. 
Hope will be found though. Proverbs 21.6 The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor. This word is used again there. And a snare of death. It's vanity. Verses 3 and 4 in Ecclesiastes. What does man gain by all the toll, toil at which he toils under the sun? Many of you are going to wake up tomorrow morning to an alarm clock and it's going to be Groundhog Day all over again. Remember that movie? The alarm goes off, same day, different story. What does it gain for all that toil? Solomon gained it all. He was not only rich in wisdom, but he was rich in wealth. He said, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Today people are born, today people die. But the earth continues. You and I are going to die someday. And our life is going to be a vapor. Psalm 144 Verse 4, man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. I would suggest that anyone over 40 would look back and go, where in the world did my life go? Anyone just raise your hand with that? It's like it's just gone. If you're younger than that, just take it from us. (laughs) Best quote I ever heard, especially with little kids around, the days are long, but the years are They're short. It's but a vapor and it's gone. Your time is just gone. It's gone. It's gone. And it seems if you're focusing on the situation around you, it all seems like vanity when you're in the minutiae of it. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 2. For the household gods utter nonsense. And the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for the lack of a shepherd. Those other gods in our life, they utter nonsense to us. Come and find happiness in this. And this can be fun things from the outward appearance. They can be good things. It's like, come and do this. Come and do this. You'll be happy. Happy. I've heard this saying when I was in college. It said, happiness comes from happening, but joy comes from the Lord. We could go around this room and say what happy events have happened to us. We could spend this whole time talking about the good things. And some of you, we all have had good things. Unless you're ultimate pessimist. And you haven't found any light in it. But we could all go around and say, man, this was good. But it's fleeting. Fleeting. It's like... Buying that new car, if you ever bought the new car, and a year later, eh, I want something new and shiny. I want something that's going to make me happy. It's vanity. More than likely, it comes with a big mortgage. I'm not mortgage, excuse me. Loan, whatever, yeah. That you got to pay. And then you get trapped under the weight of the cost of the new thing. Some of you at Christmas time get into debt to try to make people happy. And the next six months can turn into misery because of the debt that is built up. Here he goes. Those gods offer empty consolation 
They say we want to help you and put our arm around you. But there's nothing there. The vapor. We suffer for a lack of a shepherd. Now, that's a choice. Is it going to be the happenings and the other gods and the idols that bring you life? Or is it going to be the shepherd? Have you been suffering from a lack of a shepherd this week, this month, this year, this decade? To know God in your head, but not to express sort of what Kennedy said, this, this, we're going to express praise and worship for who He is, no matter our circumstance, no matter our situation. Verse 5 and 6. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. This evening you can look probably on your watch, some of you, and you can see when the sun's going to set. You can see when the sun is going to rise. And it goes that over and over and over again. And then in verse 6, the wind blows to the south and then goes to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. Different times, different seasons, the wind blows. Feeling discouraged yet? You look at it. You can. You can go. I used to look at Ecclesiastes and go, man, if this is what I have to look forward to, take me now. Take, just take me now. Verse 7. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. If you, you were all from around water here, tide comes in, tide goes out. Full moon accentuates all those things. The tide goes in, out, the current moving, not moving. If you're a fisherman, you pay attention to that current. Because it's helpful in fishing. Pro tip, just so you know. The current is important. But the streams, they get bigger and smaller. And we keep living and living. And we toil and we work and we suffer and we have happiness in between. But King Solomon's like, it's all vanity. Verse 8, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Goes back to the looking and seeing what is going to make me content next. What is said differently? What is going to pacify this need I have in here that nothing else has. Is more work going to do that? No. You're going to be weary. I'm familiar with weariness. Is it going to be the next thing we look at, the next thing we do, the searching on Amazon for the next thing to arrive on our front porch? To be excited. And I think some of you don't even know what's in the box. You've ordered so much. Oh, I wonder what that is. I can't remember. You know, you see this new thing. I'll pick on guys. Man, if you hunt. Man, this new decoy is out. This new camo is out. Man, I got to get it. Because those deer, I, I don't want them seeing me. You know, I've been out in jeans and, and a... And a and, and the deer never saw me. <laughs> my stepfather used to try to get over on my mom. He'd go, he'd provide all these deer, and he would go, look at all the money I have saved our family. 
My mom was not one to be trifled with. She listed the amount for the guns. She listed the, all right, stop now, like, stop, stop. She listed the amount for the guns, for the corn, to feed the things, for, oh man, I'm getting guys in trouble. You're not, oh man, they're not going to come back anymore. But it's like, it's like, you know, it's like, man, I got to have this. I got to have this. Like, I, I would go, because I've just, at one point in time, I was a good fisherman. At one point in time. I'm not anymore. But I would go to the fishing store and buy some lures, remembering glory days and thinking someday I'm going to use it. And it's sitting in the wrapper. It's, a, it's just, it's vanity, right? It's just like, it's not done any good. Oh, look at that new piece of jewelry. Oh, I got to have it. Look, look, look at the new clothes. I mean, we're all guilty, right? This isn't beating on anybody. We are all guilty of this. You might go, well, Eric, I'm poor. You still do it. I did it when I was poor. I mean, I used to go to Walmart to find joy in what maybe I could buy some day. It's like that was just where it was. I'm going to go look at what I can buy someday. Put it on layaway, yeah. <laughs> and then you forget what you had on layaway. Oh, what did I order? It's not that important anymore. Verse 9, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new. When I thought more of myself than I should have, I used to think that I found something in Scripture that no one else had found. And I'm like, man, I'm good. Look at this. No one. And then I pick up a book that's 200 years old, and there it is. Vanity. There's nothing I have new to offer you. Wisdom was known, Solomon was known for wisdom. But this is where his mind took him in his search for joy found in things other than God. Verse 10. Is there a thing of which it was said, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. Verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after me. You know, in the end, I think when you get older, you start thinking about legacy. This is just what I've observed. How are people going to remember me? After a hundred years, I'm going to be a name on a piece of paper and maybe a few pictures of people who didn't even know who I was. It's vanity. There's hope. But I want us to just settle in. I want you to settle in on where your hope has been found in. Because Solomon had it all. He was truly the smartest person in the room. Remember the spitter? Smartest person in the room? Spitter? He was. He was the wisest. And he had all the funds. He had everything. And he found it to be useless. Matter of fact, one wife wasn't good enough for him. Instead of finding joy in one, I'm going to get 900 some. I'm going to find my happiness there. And those weren't enough. He had concubines too. 
He is not the person I would say you look at to, like, that's how I want to live my life. But these are his observations at a season of his life. He is not the person that you'd want to come and give uh, your best life now saying speech to your graduation students. He would stand up there going, it's all vanity. You're going to work and you're going to die. The end. So now is where I have my little bit of fun. There's nothing new under the sun, right? This is where I'm going to release something I think is is new to me, all right? But there's nothing new under the sun. This word hebel and hevel, this Hebrew word, and and, and it's it's worked into English, means a vapor or a breath. In Scripture, oh no, not that one yet. Okay. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> sorry yeah so next slide please <laughs> so Cain and Abel remember them we've all heard the story I think Cain did not offer a good sacrifice and Abel offered the best sacrifice and what did Cain do he stoned his brother to death now just imagine You did the right thing. You honored God. And someone murdered you. Do you know that the word for Abel, Tebel, it's vanity. It's a breath. Next slide, please. This is the next word in the Strong's Concordance. We saw the earlier one. Hebel or Havel is the second son of Adam. It, it literally means a vapor. God knew when he was named that his life would be a vapor. So here's what I want you to see. Some of you might have lost a child or someone close who had a child who had very little bit of life in them. It was a breath. It was a vapor. Maybe it was a miscarriage. Maybe there was loss due to illness. And their life, just like ours, but a vapor. Maybe, like those of us who remembered and have had a few years in our life, our life has been full. Full of years. And yet, what's going to happen to all of it? It's going to be a vapor. So we can come to the conclusion, next slide please, that all is vanity. I'm but a breath. I'm but a vapor. But here is the beauty. Abel honored God with his first fruits and he was murdered, but he was present with God. He gave God his best and God took him. Win. That is a win, yes? That's a win. His life, I did, I looked at his life. I'm like going, man, how much does that bite back in my hurry days? You know, it's like, you just, you do the right thing. You honor God. You do the right thing. The task, the self-righteous, I did the right thing, and you allow me to be murdered. That's who, if I would voice Abel, that would be my response. This is it. But absent from the body, Present with the Lord, right? He offered his first fruit and God took him. Praise God. Praise God. It is not all vanity. 
So what's the way forward in the midst of all this hevel or vanity or fleeting breath? The teacher discovers that the key to truly enjoying life is accepting it. That is, it's all passing and fleeting. Acknowledge that everything in your life is totally out of your control. Amen? Young people, young men especially, I know, oh no, men and women, sorry. I know what it's like to want to control everything. Life has taught me I control nothing. And there's a peace in that place. The empty hands of God, I am yours. I am clay, you are the potter. I am the clay, mold me and make me into what you want for me. And use me how you will. Fill me to overflowing and then pour me out. About six times in the coming chapters, in the bleakest moments, in the darkest moments, we're going to go there, the teacher suddenly talks about the gift of God. The gift of God which is the enjoyment of simple, good things, such as friendship, family, a good meal, or a sunny day. In the end, if you're at peace with God, you will find and you will know that these days are vanity, but you will be present in the moment and enjoy the day that God has given you because you might not have another. And if you're honoring God, just like Abel, remember Havel? It, it's tied in. The old scholars knew when, when Ecclesiastes was written, they thought of Abel. I, has anyone here ever thought of Abel in this? Right? Okay, well, it's like here we are. Abel took, gone. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and He takes away. But we can live today with the joy and the peace and assurance that today I can enjoy my friends and family in this room. I find great joy in it. I can enjoy and did enjoy the sun rising and the sun setting. I can enjoy, enjoy the busyness knowing that this too shall pass. I can appreciate stress because I know that God is out of my control unless it is something that I need to be doing. And there's responsibility in that, right? If I'm just stressed because I'm sitting there, I'm stressed. That doesn't, there's nothing good about that. But if it's like, okay, it's tense right now. I've got to work through it. God, would you please give me strength? Give me power. Let me roll through this. He's going to give it. And if you, if you practice that, you'll start seeing it over and over again. And then it won't be like it's all vanity. You won't be telling people, yeah, my life is Ecclesiastes. It's all vanity. You'll go, no, my life today is meaningful because Jesus loved me. He died for me. He has given me his spirit. He's given me power. Praise be to God. That's where we need to live. So the conclusion. This is at the end of Ecclesiastes. Notice chapter 12. This is his summary. The man who had, quote unquote, not really, the biggest yachts, the biggest jet, the biggest funds in Berkshire Hathaway or whatever. Solomon had all of that in his day. This is his conclusion. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man.
Now, I want to play on this word a little bit before I finish. For this is the duty of man. Some of you might have heard of a teacher, a Bible teacher called John Piper. And he talked about the, what it means, the difference between duty and delight. Duty and delight. Now, Rob, how many years of marriage have you had, y'all had? I'm getting putting you in trouble. Yeah, check. 36? Okay. So on the anniversary, Rob gets 36 roses. And he knocks on the front door. The ring doorbell's going anyway, right? Like, I know their house. You're being watched. <laughs> Be careful, you know. <laughs> but Rob's going to knock anyway and maybe smile, you know, hold the flowers like this. And, and Beth opens the door, like, sort of like, why are you here? Why are you knocking? And Rob, like, pulls out these 36 roses. 37 next year, right? But 36 roses. And, and she goes, oh, why did you do this? It was my duty. <laughs> Rob going to be sleeping in my house. Or we're going to have a service here, one or the other, right? It's like... We often view God in duty. I have to do this. I have to do that. That's all vanity. It's fleeting. But next year, Rob goes to the door. 37 roses. Beth opens the door, remembering last year. I don't know how you survived another year, is what she's saying. I'm like, okay, I'm opening the door. 37 roses. And she goes, why did you do that? He said, because I could not help but do it. It is my delight to be married to you. It is my delight to know you and be known by you. And I couldn't resist. If all we do is fear God and keep his commandments, it's duty. But if we find joy in it, it is delight. 